Hi, everyone. Welcome to Microbial Minutes for Wednesday, uh, January 23rd, 2019. This is American Society for Microbiology's update on what's hot in the, microbi the microbial sciences. My name is Julie Wolf. Uh, let's dig in. Today, we're going to address two questions. The first question is going to be, can you edit your gut microbiota? And the second question is, what are the major threats to global health? Both of these things have been in the news recently, and we're going to dive into the research to discover what, what the answers to these questions are. So looking at this first question, can you edit your gut microbiota? Now, what we're going to look at is a paper from Nature Methods, and the take-home method, or the take-home message from this paper is that scientists have developed a new, easier way to genome edit gut bacteria. Uh, so this means that the edit, the bacteria within the gut can be changed directly in their home, in the gut, without having to be taken out, edited, and then put back. This is really combining two fields that are moving very quickly. One is genome editing, so the ability to take specific pieces of DNA and move them around. And the other is gut microbiome research, so learning which microbes confer human health, which are detrimental, maybe not necessarily the genes of the microbes, but other genes that might be necessary, or even products of those different bacterial um, species. So how would we be able to apply some of what we're learning in a real-world application? This paper um, provides a technique called metagenomic alteration of gut microbiome by in situ conjugation, or magic, uh, which allows the gut microbiota to be genetically modified within the small intestine, the colon, with, uh, within its native habitat, and that is pretty cool. Uh, to do this, they're not going to take CRISPR-Cas or other types of very specific genome editing tools, um, zinc finger talons, uh, et cetera. Uh, but what they're going to do is to use mobile pieces of um, DNA uh, that have a particular genetic um, deposit uh, or a sequence that they want to be incorporated to the gut microbiome at all. All right, so let's look at the nuts and bolts of how this system works. They're using an E. coli strain as a donor, which will have the, the specific piece of DNA that should be incorporated into the native gut microbiota. To get that into the native gut microbiota, they want to have conjugation occur. So the E. coli will share a particular plasmid, and they need to use a plasmid that's going to be able to conjugate with a wide variety of bacteria. So there's, of course, in your gut microbiota, there are E. coli, but there's all types of gram-positive, gram-negative, uh, anaerobes, um, aerobes, uh, proteobacteria, bacteroides, all kinds of things that need to um, be recipients of the donor DNA. The donor E. coli strain is going to be marked with an M. cherry gene. So this will be able to differentiate what the donor E. coli are from perhaps any native E. coli or other um, uh, cells that, that might be within the system. Um, so they have a conjugation system that is widely effective against this very broad system. Um, and they also have a transposon system. So the, the um, payload of that conjugation is going to be a plasmid that contains a HIMAR mariner transposon, which is a transposon system that works in a wide variety of bacteria, so it should be able to incorporate into the bacterial genome of a wide variety of different types of bacterial species. And the payload is going to have a couple of different readout genes for this particular project. Um, they tested by conferring both the green fluorescent protein gene, so instead of being red, they should be green, um, and a different antibiotic resistance gene. So they, they've used a couple of different antibiotic resistance genes, but that should also help to differentiate who has received this transposon. Of course, first they verified in vivo that this worked by incubating the E. coli donor cells with many different species that are found within the gut microbiota. Um, but then, then they tested in vivo. So they gavaged um, wild type mice. They put the, the E. coli into their stomach so it would directly go into the intestine. Uh, and then they tested a variety of different types of vectors, so the different regulatory system um, parts of the vector, so perhaps it would have different expression. Um, they looked at different payload-selectable genes, for example. They told you they used um, different antibiotic-selective genes. They looked at beta-lactamase and tetracycline resistance and different plasmid backbones. What they did in order to determine which cells were, were recipients was to look at the feces of the mice. They could use flow, um, fluorescent sorted um, 
fluorescent associated cell sorting. So they could select which cells were glowing green, not red. They could use fluorescence microscopy in order to confirm that that was true. And then in order to tell who was green, they could use 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing in order to determine what the recipient population looked at. So let's look at some of their data using the system. They were able to get within six hours of that initial gavage when the donor um, bacteria were put into the, back, into the stomach, and then the E. coli made their way down into the intestinal tract, and the mice began to defecate. Uh, within six hours, 5% of the fecal uh, bacteria had this green fluorescent protein positive M. cherry negative phenotype, meaning that they had received that transposon system, just pretty high and very quickly, right? They tested in wild type mice, as I mentioned, but they got mice from different vendors and different vendors uh, have slightly different conditions that can create different gut microbiota consortiums. Uh, and they saw the same effectivity or um, the same rate of conversion in these different background mice and which exactly bacteria received the, the payload DNA kind of varied between the, the where they had been housed. Uh, and you can see in this graph on the right-hand side uh, that they were able to distribute that DNA, that payload DNA, into an extremely wide variety of bacterial types. So if you're looking at the um, gray, the black and white um, heat map, that's basically the, the concentration of bacterial species within the fecal matter. But if you look at the orange heat map, those are the different bacterial species that were representative um, that were able to be detected through this flow sorting um, fluorescence microscopy and 16S ribosomal RNA uh, sequencing technique. So they were able to get an even broader um, array of different types of microbes to be, um, tr to be the, the recipients uh, than were perhaps representative within the, the fecal matter. Even those very minor species were able to be transformed. Uh, the persistence, however, did not last um, for the duration of, uh, of very long. It, it was within maybe two or three days that green fluorescence protein um, signal was no longer detected. And you can see on the very far right-hand side, there are some graphs looking at uh, how long they were able to detect these. In the text, they set up to 72 hours. If you look at the graph, it looks like it's maybe even less than that. So they don't have a, um, an amazing amount of duration, which is an important thing. So one of the reasons why people are looking at the ability to um, transform your gut microbiota is because things such as probiotics do not have a very long life within, within the gut. And so in order to confer any be beneficial um, uh, effects that you have from taking those probiotics, one has to continue taking them over time. So instead of necessarily having to take that probiotic over time, if we were able to change the bacterial DNA of our gut microbes so they had those beneficial effects that would potentially um, circumvent the problem of the, the transient nature of those probiotic bacteria. So this, um, this was received um, pretty positively uh, on social media. There were a number of people who shared this research, including the lead scientist, Harris Wang, uh, as well as others in the synthetic biology community. Uh, synthetic biology is really the application of a lot of the genetic engineering processes that have been developed over the years. Now, again, this is not something that is going to necessarily be able to affect other things that were in the news in the last week, such as this, um, this research about people who are the ideal fecal microbiota transfer um, donors. So this, uh, those particular uh, fecal matter transplant do um, donors, they have a very um, specific and uh, very well characterized uh, diversity, which I think would be very hard to recapitulate in this type of system. However, if you recall at the end of last year, I think it was around the end of the summer, there was a paper in which there was an E. coli strain, which was described as conferring uh, a human metabolic byproduct that would help people with uh, the rare disease phenylketonuria. And this is the type of thing that might be able to be treated by transferring that gene to our own gut microbiota, if necessary, rather than necessarily keeping it within um, a probiotic E. coli strain that one would continually need to be ingesting. Really cool paper, and I'm sure that we will um, come back to, to talk about this more in the future. All right, moving on. The other question we wanted to ask were, what are the threats to global health? Uh, and in this case, 
um, we're going to talk about a World Health Organization report, which categorized the top threats, the top 10 threats to global health. And really the take home message from this is that infectious diseases feature prominently in global health threats. This might not seem obvious um, to people who live in the developed world, such as the United States, where if you look at the cause of death, um, infectious disease is pretty far down on the list. I think it's number five where you get to lower respiratory infections. Respiratory diseases is above that, but those are generally diseases that are non-infectious, things such as COPD. Um, but if we look at the worldwide um, causes of death, we see that that balance changes slightly. Uh, lower respiratory infections are the um, still uh, somewhat further down, around five, but there are a lot of other infectious agents that show up in this worldwide cause that don't show up in the United States deaths, things such as HIV and malaria, that either due to um, infrastructure of the medical system or just prevalence of the disease are not really major causes of, the, of death in the United States. This can be divided even further if we start to striate based on um, income level of countries. So if we were to look at uh, upper middle income countries versus lower middle, uh, lower income or lower middle income countries, you can see again that infectious diseases start to become much more prevalent um, in those uh, low income countries that don't have access to medical care and perhaps don't have the sanitation level or um, just the access to, to medicines or vaccines that might prevent some of these infectious diseases. So if we look at what those top 10 threats are, um, and this of course is going to be linked underneath um, the, the presentation. So if you want to read for yourself, go ahead and click that link. But six of the top 10 highlighted in red here have to do with some sort of infectious disease. You can see global influenza pandemic, antibiotic resistance, Ebola and other high threat pathogens, vaccine hesitancy, dengue and HIV. And so many of these things are what you might think uh, are big deals within the developing world. Um, and this was written up within uh, a number of different outlets, CNN, The Week, The Independent. It's all highlighted this aspect, perhaps because they were the major uh, parts of the list. Uh, and many of them quoted directly from that report, um, saying that uh, highlighting the vaccine hesitancy issue, vaccine hesitancy, the reluctance or refusal to uh, vaccinate despite the availability of vaccines, threatens to reverse progress made in tackling vaccine preventable diseases. And while many of these diseases are things that we consider um, problems of access or problems of um, not necessarily having the, the infrastructure, this is an issue that hits home, hits, hits close to home here in the United States. Uh, just this last week in Portland, Oregon, the public health officials declared an emergency due to a measles outbreak within a vaccine hesitant uh, community in which not all of the residents are are vaccinated. And measles is an incredibly infectious disease, so it's able to spread with, with just a very, very small um, exposure to a, number of, a very small number of virions. Uh, I do want to highlight that ASM, um, although we are the American Society for Microbiology, uh, does participate in a number of different global health programs. We have links below if you want to check out um, either an interactive map that highlights some of the different programs in which we are uh, participating, or if you want to read a little more in depth, we have the global impact report of uh, of what ASM has contributed over the last couple of years. All right, that's going to wrap up our microbial minutes for uh, Wednesday, January 23rd. We have learned today that scientists have developed a new, easier way to genome edit gut bacteria. And we have learned that infectious diseases feature prominently in global health threats. Now you may have noticed that this is slightly different than our previous microbial minutes sessions. I'm only highlighting two stories. Uh, and this is because things break so quickly uh, that we want to come more come to you more frequently. And so we're going to be highlighting fewer stories, but more frequently on these microbial minutes. If there's anything that you want to see uh, that is recently highlighted in the news or somewhere um, published in one of the, the microbiology journals, go ahead and leave us a link or a comment down below. Subscribe if you want to um, make sure to reach uh, to receive all of the rest of the microbial minutes um, upcoming. And I'll talk to you next time.